about it. Start tweeting now so that they'll get here. Uh, my name is Chelsea Rosti. I get to ch uh, serve as the Chief of Staff at Denver Economic Development and Opportunity. And I hope in about a month's time you'll see why this is all relevant. But in the meantime, um, I just wanted to come up here and thank a few people and introduce this great panel who probably doesn't need a whole lot of introduction, but we're going to do it anyway. So thanks for being here at Denver Startup Week. Um, thanks, of course, to the title sponsors who made this possible, Amazon, Capital One Cafe, Dell for Startups, and the Downtown Denver Partnership. Um, this session is obviously a spotlight track, um, and it is sponsored by Southwest Rapid Rewards by Chase. And um, I won't get too much farther into that, but please share your experiences and the things that you hear today by using the hashtag Den Startup Week. Um, I think you're going to hear a lot of really interesting, um, really cool things today. So I just really can't wait. But before, um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the moderator of this wonderful panel, Diane Miles. Um, again, probably very little introduction needed for this wonderful woman. If you've been to Startup Week, you've probably seen her, met her, um, had drinks with her. She's the CEO and founder of Dope Mom Life, and she's just one of those people, again, that just lights up a room, and you'll, you'll soon see this. Um, in founding Dope Mom Life, Diane saw a need for a creative content agency that is able to connect to underrepresented demographics, so she decided to combine her vision for Dope Mom Life Vlog with the work of her video production, Dope Mom, sorry, Dope Life Media. So it is in this way that Dope Mom Life was reborn with a newfound mission to cultivate relationships between organizations and multicultural communities through digital and video content. And I think you'll see a little bit of that today. So without further ado, Diane, I'm gonna turn it over to you and thanks for being here today. Thank you. <laughs> And Chelsea obviously is just amazing, and she hyped me up. I so we'll see how this <laughs> works out for you and me. Um, I'm excited to be um, the moderator of this amazing conversation. Um, I brought my glasses because I'm sitting next to two really smart people. So if I ever am like I need to look a little smarter, that's why I throw the glasses. <laughs> um, so I would like to introduce both of our panelists. Um, Raju Patel is Denver president and market executive. Uh, for Bank of America, working throughout the region to connect businesses, families, and individuals to Bank of America's banking, lending, and investment teams. He leads the effort to direct the bank's resources in the market to address local priorities and help build strong communities, including investing in environmental, social, and governance ESG programs that help foster economic mobility in the community. In addition to the role um, of Denver's, in addition to the Denver president role, Raju is the market executive for global commercial banking, Bank of America in the Colorado market. He leads a team of commercial bankers who partner across the bank to deliver the full suite of services, including investment banking, credit, treasury solutions, investment manage management, and personal banking to middle market companies and institutions with annual revenues of 50 million, I could read, <laughs> uh, uh, to 2 billion. Raju Bank joined Bank of America in 1985 and has held roles in strat strategic planning, finance, credit products, and relationship management. He earned his bachelor's degree of science, of art, de his bachelor of art degree in economics from the New University of Illinois and master's degree in business administration from DePaul University. He has a F-I-N-R-A? FINRA. FINRA, registered principal. I'm gonna put on the glasses here real soon. <laughs> um, and holds a series 7, 24, and 63 securities licenses. Raju currently serves as chair of Denver Civic Ventures and is one of the management board of the Downtown Denver Partnerships. He is also on the board of the Food Bank of the Rockies um, foundation board member of the Denver Art Museum and a member of Colorado Concern. In 2021, Raju was recognized as the most admired CEO by the Denver Business Journal. Raju, I know. <laughs> one, one of 20. One of tw <laughs> You're all we're here worried about right now, Raju. <laughs> Raju and his wife, Lisa, are the proud parents of three adult children and currently reside in downtown Denver. Oh, and a mom too. I love this for us. Um, now, oh, my heart, Danielle shoots. We said we weren't going to sit next to each other because we turn into this really weird comedic act when we're together. We don't know where it comes from or what <laughs> happens, but hopefully you guys don't have to witness that today. Or maybe you want to. 
Danielle Schutz is the managing partner and managing director of the new tr Community Transformation Fund. Can we get a round of applause for that? <laughs> Definitely celebrating with some confetti tonight. <laughs> um, this transformation fund is an equity venture capital fund for BIPOC founders and the president and CEO of Wealth Inter um, Equity Enterprises, a holding company that owns several businesses that support the mission of building BIPOC wealth and leadership. Born and raised in Colorado, Danielle is a graduate of the University of Colorado at Denver, where she earned a degree in business administration. At the age of 26, Danielle embarked on her executive leadership path, ascending to the position of CFO for the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. After the state, Danielle served as, a, served as the Vice President of Finance and Business Operations for the West Division of Comcast, managing a billion dollar capital portfolio, strategic FP&A, mergers and acquisi acquisitions, and a team of 60 employees located in seven states. Most recently, Danielle was the CFO for the Colorado Trust, where she grew the foundation's endowment for, from 430 million to nearly 600 million. Another one? <laughs> Just, Cause what? She reduced cash on, cash on hand to a reoccurring 1% while operating the foundation. She also launched a direct investment portfolio across the state, making investments in local media companies, real estate and housing and small businesses, leveraging the endowments balance sheet for creative bridge financing across multiple sectors and industries. Danielle's passion for people and leadership, distinguished business acumen, and tenacity work and tenacious work ethic have garnered her numerous accolades, including inclusion on the prestigious um, 2019 list of top 25 most powerful women in business from the Colorado Women's Chamber of Commerce, the 2020 Emerging Leader in Philanthropy, in philanthropy from ABFE. Yep, I see, I'm good. I don't need the glasses anymore. <laughs> the 2018 Women of the Year Award for her work with youth in the community and a recipient of the 2017 Denver Business Journal's 40 Under 40. Danielle is a passionate community member and serves as a trustee for the Women's Foundation, a mayoral appointed board member for the Prosper Denver Fund and the, Chief, the Prosperity Denver Fund and the Chief Economic Equity Advisor to State Senator James Coleman and, Rep and State Representative Leslie Harrod. A round of applause for these two and all of their accomplishments. I get right here all day. That part's um, uncomfortable. You said it's what? I said that part's uncomfortable. No, get comfortable. The... What? <laughs> yes, no, we're so proud to have both of you as leaders in our community. Um, Danielle, I really wanna talk about your vision for the NCTF Fund. Um, why? Why did you leave your job and why did you take on <laughs> this role? Right, well, and a little background, yes. if you could provide them about the fund and you being the, a black woman leading this fund. Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting to say your vision. I think um, I have to be fair that I think this vision um, was being talked about by a lot of people who understood that we were missing equity products focused on founders of color in Colorado. Um, we didn't have one. We were on all kinds of conversations together. I think long before I thought I would do this, before I was bullied into doing this, I'll explain that in a minute. No. Um, Raju was having these conversations, and we're lucky to have him and the Bank of America team here in this region saying, what's missing? How do we figure out how to get there? And so I was just a part of those conversations, and there came a point where we were having them over and over again, but no one was saying, like, okay, well, I'll do it. <laughs> And I have a mentor, Kwame Anku, who is a venture capitalist in California. He has two funds that are 100% black founders and um, started a, a fund like ours up in Grand Rapids, Michigan as well. He's an owner on that fund and said to me, you need to do this. Like somebody's got to do it. You can do it. He understood the social capital game, game a little better than I did even at the time, right? And the importance of it when you're going to do a venture fund and go raise dollars and then make investments. And um, after calling me maybe every Monday for months, for real, <laughs> he convinced me to do this. And I was a CFO um, at the Colorado Trust at the time and talked to the CEO and said, I, I think we need to start this. And he said, yeah, you do. You really do need to do that. And they gave us a million dollar grant to go start the fund. And um, so I think enough people said, you can do this. 
that I jumped, and um, it was the scariest thing I've ever done, but I think we needed this here. Um, I'm born and raised in Colorado. You heard I've had all kinds of gigs uh, in Colorado and felt like I um, could raise the dollars, but also that I could reach founders. Um, I am a business owner myself, started a startup in 2018, it's alive and well, and I said, okay, like, I, I, I have to try. Like, if not me, then who? And um, got on the phone with Raju and, and Erica from Bank of America, and, and you encouraged me. I don't even know if you knew what you were doing that, but saying, you can do this. The capital's in the market, because I was very nervous about fundraising as a chief financial <laughs> officer, right? You're like, what? No. Um, and he said, it's in the market. You can go. And then they also got a, a grant approved to help support us get the fund started as well. So I, so I jumped, and I, I honestly can say, like, best decision I've ever made. I feel entirely supported by Colorado in a way I can't even explain. Like, folks don't really realize, like, for this to be happening in Colorado and not on a coast is just really special. Um, and it's been a ride. It's been really hard. But it, I'm feel like I'm walking in my purpose in ways that nothing that you just said on that sheet feels like I'm walking in purpose. No, you know, um, um, we have known each other for a very long time. And, and last night you shared a story that I think just made me realize exactly who you are and why you were meant to be doing the work that you were doing. And it's not a story that I've, that I've heard you share before. We're, we've, we've known each other since we were 15. We both became moms at 16 and have shared very common stories. Um, our stories have been very co similar, common, similar. But I really want people to hear this story because I'm like, this is what makes Danielle who she is. Which story is it? Oh, God. And how we many glasses of wine did I have before night. I told it? Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> um, your fifth grade teacher. Oh, yeah. Trigger word. Good. Got it. Yeah. So I um, had a fifth grade teacher who is the reason that I loved the economy and ended up going into being in roles that were an economist, right? And so our whole classroom was an economy. So everything that we learned, right? We had to run for office and earn money and buy our way to lunch and buy, you know, special recess time and ran for government. And she was just phenomenal. And she was a black woman. And I don't, you know, I don't know if they let teachers do that anymore, but she did it her way. And every day we read the Wall Street Journal to get the day started. And she was just phenomenal. And I loved economics ever since then. I think I'm sort of a natural economist too. It's kind of the way my brain works. Um, and I put those two things together, and um, I feel like, oh, for such a time as this, you never know, right? Like, on your path, all the things, all the tools that you'll put in your toolkit for such a time as this. And I didn't know it was going to be venture, but I do feel like it was um, meant to be, not to sound incredibly corny, but it's all come together in a way that you have to start saying, okay, universe, I see you. <laughs> No, and I think with that, just dig in a little bit more into what the problem is and how are you solving it. Yeah, so, you know, there's uh, $70 trillion of assets under management in this country, and 99% um, of funds are run by white men, and 96% um, of dollars um, uh, go to white men um, and, and uh, Asian men. And so we've got a huge problem to solve. For us to have those types of numbers from an industry perspective in the year 2022 is deeply, deeply concerning because that's the way our economy moves. And so to have that many people not participating in our economy and in wealth building structures within our economy is highly problematic, not just for the inequities that it's created that we all live with, but for the future of the American economy. If you're gonna be in a place where your economy uh, your, the demographics of your economy are 50% people of color. Today, they're 70% women and people of color already. If that is what's on one side of your balance sheet and the other side is all the assets and them not having access to it, the overall GDP loses. Uh, it's not take from one side and put it to the other. It's put these folks inside wealth building machines, let the tools work. We know that venture creates eight times more jobs than any other type of capitalization of a company. So why wouldn't we capitalize businesses of color in this way? Think about diversifying economies, industries, boardrooms, C-suites. I think it helps us answer so many problems, creates return, puts it right back into the market, um, and creates multimillionaires out of folks who, statistically speaking, have not had access. And, and I'm 
proud of it, and I think we are, we're going to blow returns out of the water, and um, I'm proud that Colorado gets to be in such a leading position on this. Yeah, so dig in a little bit more into who is the fund for. Yeah, so we're an early stage fund. Uh, we are uh, cutting checks at pre-seed seed up to Series A round. Average check size will be 500,000. We'll cut checks from 250 to a million. Um, we do plan to lead a lot of rounds. I think that is critical for a fund like me when we're talking about founders of color. Help to help with the fundraising process. We're um, what I call kind of old school high touch venture, <laughs> how, it, how it used to work, meaning a check is one part of the problem, but being in there and helping you solve the problems as an entrepreneur and a leader is something else that we wanted to do. So while we were raising investment dollars, we raised uh, grant dollars to support us being able to be very high touch, to bring advisors to the table um, as paid advisors, to pay our investment committee, to make sure that we have people really invested in helping grow and scale these businesses. We've got so many people at the table who are experts in growing and scaling businesses and pulling levers so that we can provide that level of support to our founders. I know you can't, I can't teach you to be a CFO overnight, even if I wanted to. And so if you need a CFO, we will help find one. We have a bucket of people who will offer those fractional services. So we thought about it as an ecosystem and that this fund will play its role in the ecosystem but certainly it's not the only piece that was needed. Yeah. So just a show of hands, how many people are entrepreneurs in the room? Okay. How many have had investments in your organizations? Okay. Um, how many of you know what a series A is, seed? Oh, we're all smart. <laughs> Everybody put your glasses on. <laughs> I was going to say dig into why you decided to to start at um, seed instead of series A or yeah well um, all along as we were building the fund we had people that knew we were building this fund we I immediately said hey I'm going to bring this fund to market and our companies helped us think about what this fund needed to be originally I was going to cut later stage checks and I realized that our pipeline was top of funnel it was earlier and that folks weren't even getting the checks upstream that would have ever got a, them to us later stage, right? So we would have had a major pipeline problem in deploying this capital. I probably would have had a hard time raising the, the funds as well. And so we wanted to meet founders in Colorado where they are, um, and we know that there are a large percentage that need capital um, at the top end. And uh, one of the things that we know was still missing, even with where we are deciding to come in um, from a capital perspective is friends and family, right? And you hear that, you hear that, oh, raise your friends and family round. And I'm like, how many of you have friends that can give you $250,000? Not I. <laughs> I have friends that call me for that kind of <laughs> I'm like, who do you think I am? No. <laughs> um, uh, so we knew that was missing. And so I'm excited that um, uh, we have a partner who is going to be launching a sister fund out of a nonprofit so that it can be incredibly flexible. We can do debt financing, equity financing, revenue-based financing, um, to cut smaller checks, to, to do the testing, the $50,000, to get your product ordered so you can prove you can sell it, to get your apps built, to get the technology done. And I think that closing that piece of the gap on top of our fund, which is what I call rocket fuel capital, um, is going to change the game, I think, in Colorado. Yeah. And I only asked her for $10,000. I did not <laughs> call her and ask her for two hundred and fifty, dollars And she did give it to me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Raju, I want you to talk about why Bank of America invested in this NCTF and why it's important to the community in closing the wealth gap for you. Sure. Um, so on the, on the heels of uh, George Floyd uh, and the pandemic, Bank of America made a five-year commitment to invest $1.25 uh, billion uh, in our communities uh, related to racial inequality and solving that. Uh, and there's uh, three things that we did. First thing uh, we did was invest in um, minority depository financial institutions. So we put $50 million of equity capital into a number of African-American owned banks. Uh, and here in Colorado, uh, American Indian Bank. And so by giving them capital, it helped them grow and get capital then to BIPOC and women-owned entrepreneurs. That was the first thing we did. 
Second thing we did is we're uh, one of the largest, we are the largest um, uh, contributor to uh, community development financial institutions, so CDFIs. Uh, and we've invested $1.8 in over 250 CDFIs. And if you don't know uh, what a CDFI is, it's uh, a lending institution that works with entrepreneurs that traditionally might not qualify for bank financing. So that was the second thing we did. We upped our commitment to CDFIs. And the third thing, the coolest thing we did was we decided we would get into the private equity business and we were not in the private equity business. We purposefully wanted to do that because we knew there was a shortage of growth capital and equity capital for BIPOC and women-owned businesses. And so we started to invest uh, in uh, venture funds that were run by BIPOC entrepreneurs as well. And we found a number of funds across the country. Here in Colorado, I started making calls two years ago and called a number of venture and private equity funds uh, in the state and said, do you have this mission of investing in BIPOC businesses and women-owned businesses? We couldn't find a fund. Uh, so uh, after a year, we decided that we would probably have to work on helping to start a fund. We knew a team in Grand Rapids, Michigan uh, that had started a fund and Bank of America was an initial investor uh, in that fund. And we came across uh, an individual by the name of Kwame Anku. Um, and Kwame was uh, the bridge, if you will, uh, to Danielle. Uh, we didn't know at the time, but Kwame was separately arm twisting, <laughs> recruiting Danielle to say, Danielle, you need to run this fund. Uh, and then Kwame put us together uh, and we said, Danielle, we'll help you get the fund uh, started. We provided a grant so that she could get the fund up and running, a grant of 250000 along with the Colorado Trust. Uh, and now we're about to announce that we will be one of the initial uh, equity partners in a fund that Diane will be running. And so that was the third thing we did. We, we decided that getting equity capital to BIPOC businesses and women-owned businesses was a great way to close the wealth gap and also get growth capital to those businesses because it was lacking. I, I want to um, highlight what you're saying because you say it like it was your job, which it's not, like for banks to do this. Uh, and, and that is, I just want to like put a pin in that because not only did you all decide to invest directly in private equity funds, which by the way, most people won't. So part of the equity gap is our funds are smaller. When you're a first time fund manager of color, your fund's gonna be 25 or 50 million or even 10 million or even 7 million, right? Which can make a huge impact because these are high return funds, but folks will not invest in funds that are that small that are large, usually. Institutions don't wanna do that. So there's so many barriers to entry, just like any systemic issue, it is built into the way the process works, right? And so not only were you saying we're gonna do something wildly different as this huge institution and invest in private equity. Then you said, we don't have a fund here, how do we build one? And, and I, just, I just think it's unheard of um, that you did that. So I just wanna point that out because it's not like that's what banks do. <laughs> they don't. And we're, we're really, really lucky because to have a Bank of America behind you, it's a social capital game. And so that opened so many doors for me when I had to go raise dollars in this fund. So, so many things that you did that made this possible. So I just wanna make sure yeah. I point that out. No, thank you for taking over my job. <laughs> They're never gonna have me back, no. <laughs> um, I really wanna to touch on why it was important for you as a black woman 
to be the one that's leading this charge in this fund and how most of our communities look at um, accessing capital and what it really means to build wealth, especially as a business owner. I can say as a small, uh, and I'm not, a, I don't even ever say that over my business, but as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, um, I've always looked at how big can I grow my organization. I never thought like this is just a vehicle to build wealth. This is just a starting piece, and my goal is to sell it off and get it and and get a large return. Yeah. Um, so. I hope you got the question that I'm asked, the couple of questions that I'm asking in there. Yeah. Um, first, let me say this. If you're an entrepreneur of color, I, I need you to read CAST if you haven't, um, please. So what I understand um, is that we have a very long history of building wealth as black folks in this country, and we have a very long history of having that wealth wiped out through systemic issues and systemic racism and systemic inequities, and you just name it almost to the point where now the history is lost on how many times we've built wealth, how many times we've have filled banks up, how many times um, we've been able to start amazing businesses. And I don't know if you know like the history of black folks, but you know, even in Jim Crow and even when you started to see lynchings, those were usually businessmen who had gotten too wealthy and done too, too, too good a job. That was the threat. And so there's a lot of distraction to what the threat is. There's a lot of distraction that we hear about in, in, in a lot of narrative and things in our society right now. But the truth is that um, wealth building is the battle that we must take on. And I know that this is a wealth building product. You just heard that. This creates millionaires. And the thing about equity is that I'm taking a percentage of your business. That's what the investment is, right? And when you have a long history, even if you don't know it here, we know it here in our guts of having things taken or co-opted um, from people of color in this country, we don't trust someone coming in and saying, you're gonna take 25% of my business or 10% of my business in exchange for this dollar. Um, and so we're really adverse to investment products. We're adverse to debt products. We're adverse to banking. Like We're adverse to being a part of the system that creates wealth, which is highly problematic. And so I think one of the humps that we have to get over is that I know it matters to have an investor who's been there, looks like you, understands the journey. And we are hearing from companies all over the country who are like, I'll move to Colorado to have an investor that looks like me so that I can trust this process because it's new. You just heard my statistics. Black women get 0.03% <laughs> of venture capital. Um, Latinas, very similar percentage. It's nothing. And so think about trying to be the first into the game, not just as a fund manager, but being the first to say, hey, yeah, I'm going to take on an equity product. And I, I can't pick up the phone and call thousands of people who have been through this because they're not there. And so I think it's really important that we build trust and we would really be kidding ourselves if we don't think part of that is lived experience and shared lived experience. And I think that will be the thing that unites us all across this country is, is we have shared lived experiences, but it starts um, for me with being a black woman, um, being a teen mom, my son's a junior at School of Mines right now. Like, this is why I am who I am, right? And so to be able to sit at a table, and you should just see founders when they sit across from myself and my managing partner, Kevin, who's a black man out of D.C., two-time exit in himself, right? He's built companies and exited them. And he's here in Colorado. He brought his third company to Colorado. He's done the experience that they're sitting across the table talking um, to us about and you should just see them get in the room and they start their pitch It's like the same words for the first five minutes that they've been told they have to say I'll say one thing and you just see this <sighs> Because they just feel safe and I just not even sure we're gonna be able to quantify that for a few more years But we do know that funds like this are starting to outperform across the country and I think that has a big piece of it Yeah, thank you for that Um, and, and just a, like, I think it's so important because you educate your founders. So now they could speak the language, especially when you're talking about communities that have been kept out of the language of wealth building and wealth creation. And to have somebody who educates them and teaches them the language so they know how to go into those conversations when we pour it, I just think it's so important. And then what's 0% of nothing? What's 100% of nothing? Yeah, remember that, right? Like. We have in our communities sometimes this dynamic around 
fear-based decision-making, which will have us make decisions where we're going to get 0% or 100% of zero, right, versus 56% of a million. And so that's the mentality I want folks to think about. If I take 10% and we make a few million dollars in the fund and return it back to investors, what does that mean for your 90? That's the goal. Most venture funds are started by folks who have exited companies, who have operated companies, made millions and millions of dollars through an exit, and now they go back and invest in other startups. Um, and so think about the ripple that we will create even with 30 companies in Colorado for generations to come from a wealth building perspective. It, the money compounds on itself, the impact compounds on itself. Yeah. So this is a question for both of you. Um, when, what does success look like for you? <laughs> I think you need to go first. <laughs> um, it, um, oh man, this is a really hard question. If I, I said earlier that it, this is the hardest thing I've ever done, and it's not the hardest work I've ever done. I've had some pretty hard jobs. They were quite fun. I like hard work. The pressure is unbelievable because it's not just um, the fund and returns, right? The second we don't hit returns, this isn't about a venture fund that didn't hit their returns. This is about can black women manage venture funds because there's not enough of us. Um, we don't get to blend into the averages, right? This fund will be, have a spotlight on it for its entirety of its existence and fund two and fund three. Now, I know we will hit returns, so I'll say that. I think we will outperform. I have an amazing pipeline of companies already that have me believing that more and more every day that we meet new companies. Um, so that's obviously success, but I think for me, if I'm being honest, when I think about what I want to do with the rest of my career, it's to build wealth for my community, and so I, I would love to see many, many millionaires sitting, you might already be millionaires, I don't know, but if you're not, we'd love for you to become that. We would love for you to understand and speak the language of wealth building, and I think more than anything, I would like us to become, you can't be what you can't see, I just said that, right? Um, I want us to become the thing that people see, that, that young kids of color see, and say, oh, like, that's what it, that's normal. Yeah, you, you grow, you scale businesses, you take, you take on venture investments, you become millionaires that way, right? You, you become millionaires in other ways besides being an athlete or being a musician. You become millionaires in this system that is the free market of the United States of America, and I would like to really normalize that conversation. I would love in 10 years for us to be sitting here having a very different conversation that isn't about having to be so specific on investing in founders of color to try to close an inequity gap, but that we look at a free market where everyone's participating and winners win, uh, no matter what, because everyone has access to it. So I think that's the long game. And um, I think in my heart, it's going to sound cushy. I, I, I believe this is also a self-worth building tool. Uh, as much as it is a wealth building tool for us to remember who we are <laughs> and where we came from um, and whose shoulders we stand on and how many people have built wealth in our generations before us um, and that we have that mindset as we move forward um, in the world, that will be another really great success point for me. So success, uh, one, I know Danielle's going to hit the return hurdle, so we not, all know. not worried about that. <laughs> There's no question. She, she might be worried about it, but we're not worried about that. Uh, so I think uh, one, is, one is that. Um, and then the, the second thing is really um, closing the wealth gap. I think that's going to be uh, a measure of success. Uh, Closing the wealth gap between uh, white Americans, Asian Americans, and BIPOC and women. Uh, I think that's going to be the definition of success. I like it. So, wow, we still have plenty of time and so many questions. <laughs> um, I want you to dig a little bit more into 
how are we encouraging and supporting our our founders of color? Um, I hate saying of color, but how are we encouraging our Black, Latina, and Indigenous founders to take on this capital? Yeah. So you know, I knew that we even before I left the Colorado Trust, I was like, okay, we definitely need the fund. But I also knew that we needed a, an ecosystem of support. And I knew there was, I, because of my work at the Trust, I knew there were a lot of people doing that work. So I knew that. I knew we had great, you know, mentorship programs. And we had Adelante, who was helping folks build businesses um, uh, across the state of Colorado. I had invested in some of these folks uh, when I was at the Trust. And so I reached out to some folks, and I'm like, if we if we commit to being an ecosystem uh, for our founders, would you get in that with me? And as I raise capital, we'll, we'll raise capital together. We'll raise grant capital together. We'll raise grant capital as a team. And um, I'm just as proud of that as I am um, of the fund because like the right people at the right time said, yep, let's go. And I'm talking the Latino Leadership Institute and Access Mode. We're hosting a happy hour with them after this. If you wanna come, please come and hang out with us. Um, which is a BIPOC tech accelerator that's launching here in, in Colorado. And social venture partners came to the table and Impact Charitable came to the table. And all of these folks, the AYA Foundation and Black Business Initiative and Makisha Booth Sister Biz said, what do, we, what do we have to do? How do we get together to make sure what, well, I hate the word technical assistance, so I'd like to replace it with the word capital ready. So how do we make sure people are ready for a million dollar check? They know exactly what to do with a million dollar check. I hate the word technical assistance. Like, oh, you're gonna go to an eight, eight hour workshop and you're gonna know how to do a pro forma and what a capital stack is or even what equity means or a convertible note. Come on, that's not real. <laughs> we need to walk alongside you um, through this process. So we sat in a room for two days and just mapped from, I have an idea to I go to IPO, right? What does this look like for our founders here in Colorado um, and who's doing what? We have legal partners that can provide um, free legal services to get you structured right for investment and to make sure that your founder agreements are in place. Stuff that keeps us out of this conversation immediately. I, I always say like that, you know, I'm a, I'm a CFO, but I'm saying like things like general accepted accounting principles and legal are like the new barriers to entry because we don't speak that language. Like, We'll come to the table, the idea will be brilliant, but our, we don't have the right founding agreements in place, and then the conversation's over, right? That says something about sophistication, which it doesn't. Um, so we said, how do we get the barriers down as best we can? And we're, you know, we'll do a little bit. There's so much more that needs to be done, but I mean, we are gonna pay back office providers directly. So if you need a C fractional CFO, we'll negotiate a contract for them to take on portfolio companies to support the companies in the portfolio. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a good investor, but I'm a really good businesswoman. And I'm an, I know how to look at a PL and and pull a lever and go, if you stop doing those six things, or if you start doing these six things, and I can slice them anyway, the sales channel, sell it here, don't sell it here, you don't make money here, you do make money here, that's what I do. Um, um, my investment uh, committee chair is a former chief marketing officer for Walmart Sam's. He was the head of strategy uh, for McDonald's. He invented the dollar menu. Um, he did. He did, in real yeah. life. <laughs> McDonald's stock price has never been as low as it was before he got there, ever, again. I mean, just a genius. Kevin's operator had two exits himself in tech companies, biotech, agritech. So we are trying to bring people to the table um, who can help build and scroll businesses. And Kwame always says, in, in venture capital, the winners are chosen, which is true, right? You're choosing someone because you think they're gonna be a winner. But I think what has gotten lost uh, in venture in the last few years of how it really works is, and the wins are engineered, right? So if you go into venture and you, you struggle and you, you're gonna spend money on something, you think it's gonna create this, but it doesn't, often what would happen is the investors now have a stake in making sure you succeed. That's why equity matters. That's why we wanna take on equity investments. I am an owner partly in your work. I need you to succeed financially. That's really important um, versus I'm taking over the business. No, we'll have a whole portfolio, but you want me to have a vested interest. That's what investment means in making sure that you are successful in some way. And so the check is going to be a part of that. But we have a vested interest in making sure you're successful 
in a, in a holistic way, and I'm just really grateful. You'll be hearing from NCTF soon about all the partners that we have um, in this ecosystem and this type of programming. We won't be running it out of the fund. I got to run a fund, but we have these partners uh, in the ecosystem to support folks who may not be ready for a million dollars, but we think the idea is killer, right? So I just sent a company over to a 14-week program the other day. When he's done, he will be ready for a million dollars. So it's that type of thing. I love that. And can you talk about how much you raised? Because I don't know that we announced how much you raised. Okay, so I, here's what I'll say. <laughs> um, we are having what's called a first close on the fund. So it's the first committed capital amount into the fund for investors for us into the fund so that we can start investing right away, and we will. Um, that close will happen next Friday, which happens to be my 37th birthday, so that's pretty... <laughs> I think it's gonna be the best birthday ever. I can cry thinking about that. Like it wasn't planned that way. In fact, it's you know been delayed like many times, and so <laughs> it's like closing on a house, right? Um, and what we do know, no matter what happens with the amounts, like is that we will be the largest debut first close by a black woman ever. And we are gonna raise a maximum of $50 million. First goal was 35, I think we can raise 50. I wanna make sure I can deploy it smartly, right? And not, not save it for another fund. So we'll check in at 35. But what I can say is that we've got committed capital. It might not all be in this first close based on legal paperwork. Some people might miss the boat. We're not delaying it again, but um, committed, meaning they've said we're in. Our investment committees have approved this. So now we're just going through the close process. It's like closing on a house. That's the way to think about it. Um, of $24.1 million. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Oh, I'm gonna cry on your birthday and throw confetti. We're gonna do all the things. Um, do either of you have any last comments before we open it up for questions? All I would say is I'm, we're, we're so happy that we are here. We've been working at this for two, two and a half years. And uh, it was serendipity that we found Danielle to run the fund. Uh, it's awesome that uh, she's running the fund, that we have a fund now in the front range because there wasn't one that existed. So um, we are, we're just thrilled to be an initial investor um, in Daniel's fund. And, and I'll say this, I'll just say thank you. I know there's entrepreneurs in this building. Like I have started a company that was like cake compared to starting this fund. And starting this fund is exactly what you're going through. It's, it's been like the same process. I'm raising money. It feels like you're on a job interview every day. What that does energetically to you is exhausting. So let me just say, if you're tired, that's why. It's not you. If you're scared, you're supposed to be. It's not you. Like, let those things fuel you and just know that you're not alone. Like, this has been incredibly difficult to do. And so I can only imagine if I was also trying to build and operate a company that I'm trying to raise a million dollars for, you know, it was, I'm, I had to build a little company behind the fund, but I knew how to do that. So I can only imagine, you know, I have this new perspective on what it's like to sit at a table and to have to ask folks for dollars and um, to, to not know if you're a yes or a no or to be waiting. And so let me just say thank you because it took, it took the entrepreneurs, there had to be entrepreneurs for there to be a fund. There had to be someone to invest in. So folks who have said, I'm gonna come out and do this despite every statistic saying, I won't be successful at it. I just wanna say thank you because that is what it's gonna take to make the fund successful. That's what it's gonna take um, to make the next 100 funds in this country like this. And then I'll also say, while our fund in Grand Rapids is our sister fund and we love them, we are kicking their butt. <laughs> from the amount of money we raise, and that competition will stay in place. So they, they've raised 10, so we're gonna keep, we're gonna keep uh, being competitive and, and put, keeping Colorado uh, on the map on this one. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you both for joining me. Thank you for 
um, all of the work that you do in our communities and how you're serving. Um, it's an honor to be up here. Now I want to open it up for uh, questions. So we'll write, uh, I think we'll write a first check by November. So we have quite a few companies under due diligence right now, knowing that we were going to have money to invest. We're like, okay, let's get them under due diligence in parallel. Um, one thing that, I'll say this to the folks understand, one thing that grant dollars has helped me do, which is a barrier to entry, is hire a second managing director. It's almost unheard of that a fund would be able to afford to do that. And so that is one other incredibly impressive thing that the Colorado ecosystem has supported, is that we can really run the fund with, with quality. So um, NCTF Denver is the site, and you can go on there, um, and what we'll have you do is fill out a survey just to check, like, you know, if you're, if you're a nonprofit, then, you know, venture doesn't invest in nonprofits, but there's a lot of things folks don't know about whether you're ready for venture capital or not, so you'll fill in those things, and then we, we will ask you um, for a pitch deck if you have one and, and um, get your answers, and then we set up a meeting with um, Kevin. So that's sort of how the process works. He, he'll talk to you first, um, and then if, if we think it's a viable option, then we have a process to move you down the line and, and then go into due diligence, which means we're checking financials. and. We might call a customer if you've got customers or um, looking at things. Um, and so that's how you can, right now, let us know about you and your companies. Um, please do. Like I said, pipeline is the reason the fund can be here. Your companies are the reason a fund can be here, and it's certainly the reason a fund can be um, successful. So that, that's how you can find us. And I, 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 I was a little worried we'd have a hard time Sourcing deals, I am not, I have, do not have that fear any longer after we announced the fund a few, a few months ago. Yes. Um, it's kind of crazy that it's only been a year, but it really has. Like, I decided to leave a year ago, which is wild. Like, that's fast, by the way. Like, really fast um, to be able to stand one of these things up. Um, so the first question is, in oh, okay. I love that question because I part of wealth building is we need to get folks investing. Now, on a fund like mine, there's rules. Um, and so you, you can invest as an individual, but you have to be a, an accredited investor. So we do have individuals in, in the city of Denver who have invested in this founding round, which is wonderful. Um, but there's some rules around being an accredited investor. That being said, there is a fund in Colorado called Sweater. They got the Sweater Ventures and they've democratized venture capital. So if venture capital is a place that you would like to invest and get involved in, I do. I have direct investments in companies through venture funds in my portfolio. They're high returns, high risk, high return. That's all real. Um, but funds are great because it blends, right? It means one company cannot do so well and another company can do really well and then you get a blend of that and that creates the return for the fund. That's why doing a fund is the right way to do this. Um, but uh, Sweater Ventures, is it Sweater or Sweeter? Am I saying, do, am I, it's Sweater, right? Okay, I got it right. I'm like, just question that in the moment. Um, they're actually a FinTech company not that create, created a fund that you can actually go invest in. I think their minimum amount is $700. So what they're doing is basically crowdsourcing their raise from people um, on their fund. And so they won't be like us. They won't be high touch and they won't be working with, 
with the companies they invest in, but then they have investment professionals that invest um, on behalf of all the folks that did that. So the, the, I, I don't know if it was SEC, but wh wh whatever happened, a rule was passed so that this would be allowed and so that you don't have to be an accredited investor to invest. We are, we are still pretty traditional, big check size coming in, big check size going out. Um, and so you have to be an accredited investor at this time um, to invest. But even that stuff in the system is getting a lot of conversation. Like I said, I have so much hope because overall GDP growth is gonna be reliant on us using financial systems. We need to have banks. <laughs> we need to have homes. We need to leverage those homes to start businesses. We need to do the cycle of wealth building um, and you can't have this many people in your population not doing it and continue to grow your overall economy. And then you said, yeah. So right now, if you take the survey on our site, it'll tell you here's partner. You're not ready for venture, or maybe you know venture is not the right capital for you, or uh, and but here's partners that we would like you to work with in order to get capital ready. We're going to get really smart with that algorithm, and all of our partners will have the same survey, but we'll actually based on the way you fill it out. So just give us a couple months to get it going. We're already working on this on the back end. It'll say oh, we would love for you to join the Latino Entrepreneurship Accelerator Program, which is for all, all founders of color out of the Latino Leadership Institute. It seems like you're a great fit based on their programming. Oh, we would like you to join this accelerator. Oh, we have an ideation workshop we would like you to go to. So do we get people started so they're not just stuck. Um, so based on how you fill out the survey, we'll understand where you are from an overall ecosystem movement perspective and then get folks uh, to the right partner uh, in the ecosystem. And we'll keep adding partners. The more we find out people are doing this work, I just found another um, institute the other day that does ideation work and there's not a lot of people who do that. So I'm like, we'll add folks to this ecosystem and to our websites and um, we'll bring on partners as we find out people are doing this work uh, for our targeted population. Yeah, and we have about um, eight more minutes. So ask your questions and quick. And it's really for me words. because I am long-winded. Well, <laughs> we're going to go right here and then we'll come to you. Oh, can I get the lights back? Mood lighting. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the presentation and this excellent example of synergetic uh, approach. I have the question to Raju for you. You said that you have three elements the company does. It means invested 15 million in a project for Indians and African, and then the financial institution, etc. And how all these elements are combined, if any, with corporate social responsibility of the company? And the second question is, do you deliver this information to your external stakeholders, like for example, the clients of the bank? Uh, I'm going to have you repeat the first question. So uh, we talked about the three efforts, and your question related to that is? Uh, is it combined with the strategy of the company in corporate social responsibility? It is incorporated or it is extra effort? It is not uh, included in this, uh, let's say, shape? Great question. Uh, it is absolutely... Uh, part of our corporate social responsibility. And one of the things we believe is that we as a, as a bank are only as strong as our local communities. So we know that we must invest locally and help the strength of our communities because doing that will help us become stronger. So definitely part of our overall corporate uh, social responsibility efforts. And your second question? Do you deliver this information for stakeholders? For example, the people coming to the Bank of America decided to open the, the account. For example, African uh, Americans or uh, Hispan or, um, Mexican people. Do you uh, de deliver the information that, for example, our bank is do, uh, does so tremendous efforts due to support underprivileged, let's say, communities and people? We do. Um, it, it's, it's on our website. But um, I think um, what I'm hearing from you is we probably can do a better job of getting that out. And so uh, we're going to take that advice and think about how we might get that message out more effectively. Thank you. Hi. First of all, can y'all make some noise for everybody up here on the stage? <laughs> so powerful. This, I've been totally inspired since I walked in. 
My name is Nisha Nice. I am an artist. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I am also a philanthropist and first female head of creator equity and inclusion for a startup company called Loco Plus. We are Go Loco Plus on Instagram, and that's the website. But my question is to you, Queen. First of all, congratulations on everything that you have going on. So powerful. Yes, we stand on the shoulders. Girl, you had me over here fired up. But what I want to say is, what would be your advice? I also want to talk with you about mentorship on this side. <laughs> Okay, because Queen, that representation is important. What would be your advice to someone like me who is new in the tech space, coming from artistry, coming from philanthropy, to continue to represent um, a place of inclusion um, and equity across the table for people like me? What would be your advice to empower me to keep going if you had some words? Yeah, I do. Um um, well, my first word is keep going because you have to, we have to, like we, I don't really, I, I really operate in a way where I don't feel like I have a choice. We don't, cause you're right. We stand on some shoulders and I know how many doors were kicked open for me that made this possible. So how am I going to make things possible for my 15 year old daughter that may not even be possible for me today, right? So that's, that's one, but I, I genuinely believe this, which is that you, you use the things that broke the system to fix the system. And I, I, I feel like we don't talk about that enough, right? That's what we're doing here. We're, it was a, uh, our racial divide in this com country was an economic decision. It was an economic decision, it was. That's why I told you to all go read Cass so you understand what I'm saying. Um, and so we have to use those same tools to unwind it. And if we don't understand those tools, we can't unwind it. We need to be able to say, I know the code, I speak financial language a little bit, I can unwind this thing with, with you, right? And so it's getting inside even when it's hard. It's sitting at tables with people that don't look like you but who want to teach you this. I have been on boards in Colorado since I was 19 years old. It has changed my entire career, nonprofit boards. Because who you're sitting next to, what they do for a living, Oftentimes they don't look like us, but they're there because they have a heart for something similar to you. I learned more from people that I sat on boards with for the last, how, how old am I? Get, the last 19 years, wait, that's not how math works, um, of my life. And so get on board, get on nonprofit boards. They need us, like start there um, to learn and then know why you're doing it. Like know why you're doing everything you do. One thing about our community is that we say yes to a lot of things. I need you to know where your yes comes from because we're spread too thin and we're running on hamster wheels and we're not making the progress that we need to. I'm speaking to myself. I am the choir in this situation. <laughs> but we need to be able to be like, what is it that I want to do? What is the legacy I want to leave? When I realized I wanted to wealth build, that's where the yes for this came from. That's where the strength that it takes to do this is coming from is to understand the long game here for me and the legacy that I want to leave for my children but in community and so do that and and get involved in boards and be willing to have uncomfortable conversations I also say assume good intent what I believe maybe this is just for survival most people want to fix this and we don't even know where to start we were handed something that is so deeply embedded in our society and our bias and who we are and how we operate and how we look how we feel about ourselves, that we have to really say, I'm gonna assume good intent until I learn different. And you're gonna get burned a few times, you are. But you're gonna win a lot. And someone's gonna take you somewhere that you didn't know you could go. And you're gonna meet a Raju and an Erica and they're gonna say, come, you can yeah. do this thing, right? And you had to be willing to have the conversation and be terrified to do it. And. And um, we are out of time for questions. Oh. <laughs> Danielle is always around. There's a happy hour tonight. I want to wrap up and just, um, in, in addition to what Danielle said, join the boards, but make sure they benefit you just as much as you benefit them. Don't just join them just to join them. There's, there needs to be a fair exchange. And as black women specifically, we oftentimes just want to be of service. That's great, but make sure it benefits you too. And there's gonna be a lot of uncomfortable conversations that you have to have in doing this work, and especially when you're talking about inclusion and diversity and equity. And so just make sure that you protect yourself and your energy and your spirit, because it's gonna be a hard conversation to have every single time. But have it, even when your voice shakes, 
um, and say the thing that nobody else wants to say, because that's going to get you exactly where you want to go. Thank you both for joining me for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.